and welcome to the first edition of Biospheric Engineering, a Planetary Defense of Humanity. In this bi-monthly show, we want to bring to you a picture of what must be done to secure the global food supply from the standpoint of planetary defense. As we have discussed on this site and through the recent LPAC basement research team paper, Planetary Defense and Extraterrestrial Imperative, the crisis in food is only one aspect of the solar and galactic threats we're faced with, which are exacerbated by a severe political crisis. Now, there's no way we're going to be able to, to address a food crisis from the standpoint of only producing more food. It will require an upshift of the entire system, which means reviving the commitment for mankind's extraterrestrial existence. Now, mankind's work in space has fundamentally altered our relationship to food production here on Earth. The transformation of agriculture from an Earth-based view on the ground to the view of millions of farms over entire continents has marked a major shift in mankind's power over nature. Now, we have the foresight to be prepared for severe weather, monitoring crop disease, pest swarms, and even transmitting crucial data directly to farmers for precision farming. All of this is done from our space-based capability, which is being shut down by President Obama. What we want to discuss today is where we're at as a result of this move away from science in the food supply and what we'll need to do to return to it. And to give us a thorough picture of what exactly we're dealing with is EIR's agriculture economist, Marsha Mary Baker. So hello, Marsha. Hi, Limari. Thank you for being with us. So first off, I just want to return back to where we were at in November, because at that point, the harvest had just come in, and we were looking at a global food shortage. We saw that we were exactly at a point where we had only half of what we needed in terms of global supply in order to meet the requirements for our 7 billion population. So could you review what was going on at that point and where are we at since then? Right, and let's take up from, as you, you implied, from space, looking at the planet as a whole. If you take the total production of all kinds of grains around the world, as you say, we're about half of what you'd need to really feed everyone uh, with a good diet, and that includes anyone who might want to live on yams and tubers and roots and potatoes. That's a good thing, too, but there isn't enough of any of it. And just a number for total world grain production for the current period, it's about um, 2.3 billion uh, metric tons, 2,200, 300 metric tons. And we, we're talking about wheat, rice, corn. And in the United States, as we were talking about after the harvest in November, Thanksgiving time, we produced less last year wheat, rice, and corn than we had the year before. In other words, we were on a downward trend. People will remember the floods, the drought, the freezing and all. And let's get very specific about the, um, let's take one thing, let's take corn, for example, and follow that through what it means in terms of people not having enough food. Because here, what we've got is, here in North America, we have a situation in Mexico that since the 1990s and the uh, imposition of North American Free Trade Agreement and World Trade Organization, Mexico was told, you export things like frozen cauliflower and melons and avocados, and, so, and you can rely on the United States and the rest of the world market for your tortillas, for your corn, the national diet. Well. The corn isn't there on the world markets. Mexico had a terrible drought, as has had Texas, Arizona, Southern California. This is called the Great American Desert, this part of our continent. And they have the worst dry situation in Mexico in 70 years. They, to be exact, they need around 30 million tons of corn just to, to eat on a level that isn't sufficient. They, they aren't going to produce uh, maybe 18 or 20 million. That would be maximum. Where are they going to find the 10 million? Here in the United States, the corn crop we had last year was down. Even if we had everything perfect this year, 40 percent of it all is going into ethanol distilleries all across the Midwest, this crop. So I want to just zero in on that. Right here on our own continent, we face this situation. And President Calderon of Mexico, 
a month or more ago, distributed a quarter million dollar emergency food packets, a quarter million, quarter million in number emergency food packets. But that's not going to provide the food for millions of people who don't have it. Children are staying home from school. They don't have enough food in the states of Durango and many other places. I just can't underscore enough. This is an immediate current crisis. Now, there are different particularities in other parts of the world, but what it adds up to is, is we're kind of going from crop to crop, season to season in different parts of the world. The second biggest exporter of corn in the world is down here, is Argentina and South America. They're going to harvest in six weeks or, or longer. Their crop's going to be way down. They happen to have had a drought. And so that also means there's less available for places to obtain it who can't grow it around the world, like in, if they need it in North Africa or somewhere. So the, what this adds up to is kind of like the hope and pray method of, of let's produce food instead of a policy. Of course, the policy is what we've had for decades, the kind of London, best called a British Empire policy of creating conditions where people, nations aren't food, aren't supposed to be even attempt food self-sufficiency because of the World Trade Organization, and there's speculation in price. So you have terrible conditions. And just to underscore mentioning about the weather, we have a situation of terrible cold in uh, Europe and it go in East Europe and so forth. So the, the bread belt of southern Eurasia, that's southern Russia and into Ukraine, they have, uh, in the southernmost parts, they plant the wheat in the fall, it's dormant, and it comes up in the spring. They're going to probably have a lot of winter kill. Mm -hmm. They may have much less wheat next summer. Yes. So from the northern to southern hemisphere, instead of collaborating among nations to do something on an emergency basis to increase the volume of food, yeah. we're in this crisis. Yeah, and all of these are examples of how it is the system itself that is actually creating crises in the weather. I mean, these weather conditions, albeit bad, albeit things we, you know, we can say that we could not predict, are made worse by the fact that you have a whole system which is made to kill people. Yes, because the... Uh it was imposed and on nations and accepted by people, that's another story, who were dumbed down or gullible mm -hmm. about 40, 50 or more years ago to say, oh, you can rely on the money system. The markets will induce farmers to, to plant more when the price is attractive or they'll avoid planting something if they think to, crazy stuff like that. And instead of uh, the decisions, like, as were made under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, to go out and encourage agriculture by putting in more water, by putting in more transportation, by putting in... Mm -hmm. So this particular area, I happen to mention in terms of the corn shortage and the immediate crisis of the food supply in Mexico. Mm -hmm. It's mass hunger there now. Um, this particular area would have been built up by the year 2000, by the time we're talking with the North American Water and Power uh, Alliance mm -hmm. proposal from the 1960s, from the time of President Kennedy. But instead, do you know, all this, all the, th this is a desert by definition. So it gets far less than 20 inches of rain a year. It only has three major river systems. That's it, the Colorado, the Rio Grande, and the Sacramento-San Joaquin. It has other streams. They are 100% used. People, the wells are depleted. The, all the dams, the beautiful dams to impound the water can't, if, if it's, there isn't enough, no matter how well they do a job to impound it. And so this is the end of the line, just mm -hmm. what you say about this, but this is a policy decision. It wasn't Mother Nature who did this. It was man's not intervening. And another thing I want to emphasize, just so, I mean, it really sinks in to the American population especially. I mean, we're not just dealing with crises that are in third world countries, in less developed countries. I mean, it's hitting, it's hitting home here. And what we're looking at is, I mean, for instance, some of the recent severe weather events have imposed a kind of condition that could take years to even recover out of. Right. And that's what, again, we could do something about it, but I'll give you an example of just what you said. Remember, the, uh, a year ago, there was a big snowpack up in the northern 
Rockies in Montana. There was the Missouri River had this record flow. It came down through uh, the Dakotas in Montana and then farther down in Nebraska and Iowa. Well, some of those beautiful uh, uh, acre, uh, uh, farms along the, between Nebraska and Iowa were inundated with water in those farm counties along the riverbank for maybe two months. And some of them have sand six inches deep. Maybe you can plow that under. But some of them have a foot, two feet. You can't. You have to remove that. You have to rehabilitate the soils. Uh, the governor of Iowa said a week ago, we don't have the money. We're doing the best we can. We have over 130,000 acres in western Iowa and the Missouri River that will not be planted in April because they haven't been able to deal with this. Now, that gets to the... Uh, deliberate um, criminal negligence of the Obama administration not to do something about it. But take that example and then multiply it in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that every one of these regions that are going through these severe crises, I mean, their plans on the books by the Army Corps of Engineers, how to deal with them, how to prevent them, but they just have not been implemented. Right. And I can't underscore enough the question of the, you said that here at home or somewhere or elsewhere in Africa. The, the question of food, you can't, uh, we are at the a kind of an end of the line phase here, a, a downshift or else we're going to go up. Mm -hmm. And take the something that has a longer lead time than next April's planting, okay? Although that has a lead time too. And that's the meat supply. The cattle situation, for example, has been concentrated traditionally out here in cowboy land in Texas, western Oklahoma, western Kansas. And whereas some years ago we had 100, 100, 110 million cows of all kinds in the country, and maybe 20 million of them were in these, this zone, these western, multi-state zone, the whole thing is dropping. Uh, a month ago, it was uh, the national tally by the Agriculture Department, even if they, they aren't that reliable, but it was only 90 million animals, not over 100 million. Texas, instead of 13 million, down under... Uh, 11 or 10 million. Because the water isn't there, there's a hay shortage throughout the West because of all the problems from last year, and the and emergency measures aren't being taken care of. People are either downsizing their herds or ranchers are selling out. So that's the uh, chain reaction we've got underway. One of the things I do want to address is, in the context of all this, there's a lot of people who will say, we have fixed resources. There's a reason why there's a food shortage. It's because there's not, there's too many people in the world. And it's interesting because I was just reading Kraft Erica's view of the earth. You know, Kraft Erica being um, one of the major space pioneers of, of the space program, who said, Meadows and Forrester of the Limits to Growth crowd, they think of the earth as if we're on a life raft in a very hostile environment when in reality, we're actually in something more like a womb. And he compared the earth to, you know, an embryo inside a, a womb, in which the embryo at its eighth month might start to think, wow, there, there's a lot of waste in here. You know, things are getting very cramped. There's not enough room for me to grow. And might project into the 10th, 11th month, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to exist here any longer but then realizes that his frame of reference is totally changed when birth occurs. And suddenly, the whole array of fixed resources that the embryo had uh, completely flies out the window. Now, recently, in a lot of our discussions on the weekly report with the LPAC basement team with Lyndon LaRouche, this has been taken up directly. And one of the discussions that has occurred is specifically around you know, our need to fundamentally push our boundaries towards a extraterrestrial existence, how that will fundamentally alter our relationship to the present. And what I want to do is just play a short clip for, for you and for our audience on that concept from the weekly report. So we can have an idea of what kind of new resource accessibility we would have were we to start to industrialize and develop the moon. That gives us an idea of where we could be in the future. That idea of where we could be in the future now becomes, in a sense, the context for determining 
how we must act now in organizing our economy. We have a sense of, hey, were we to get to the moon and start to industrialize it, we'd have access to all these other resources. We'd have access to these other powers for mankind. We can now think in terms of, say, our credit system now, how we would start to organize the flow of material resources and activity here on Earth now as a function of where we intend that we must be in the future. As you do that, you actually create a very interesting thing. And we'll have an animation on this. That as you start to act from the standpoint of where you must be in the future to determine your flow of activity now, you actually start to increase the, the rate of activity now, which in fact pulls forward what would be the, the collapse point of your economy. That, you know, going back to the biological example, you've had these, these points, as we've seen in the cones, where you had a certain growth of things like the system under the dinosaurs. That system reached a point where its growth, its characteristic of growth, could no longer keep up with the characteristic of growth and transformation of the biosphere as a whole, and so it collapsed. Funny enough, what mankind does is we actually push ourselves at an accelerating rate towards what would be one of those collapse points, intentionally, by saying we know where we need to go in the future, and by organizing our activity now to get to that future point, we actually pull what would be a collapse point closer and closer to us. <clears throat> the unique thing, though, is that if we achieve the increase of new energy flux densities by developing, say, for example, now, we want to go to the moon. We have an idea of what that would open up for mankind in terms of new resources, new powers, etc. So we accelerate our industrial activity now, our consumptive activity now, towards the development of a nuclear-based economy, towards the development of nuclear systems. That's actually going to draw down at an accelerating rate our resource availability now. But in achieving the breakthrough of developing a nuclear economy, we actually redefine a whole new resource base, and we actually overcome what would be that collapse point. And so by acting lawfully from the standpoint of where we must be in the future to determine how we must organize our activity now, mankind is uniquely able to always overcome through a type of noetic evolution these various collapse points and actually willfully drive this anti-entropic growth process. And so we've seen that with mankind something very unique that you don't find in any single species or element of the biosphere. They are, in a sense, as, as Lynn has brought up before, they're, in effect, hardwired to act a certain way. Right? They're all internal elements of the system. They act according to the parameters of the system as they were conceived in it. The system is always growing and developing. They are not. We see in this kind of process what we've been making the point on, which is that man, the creative nature of man, is actually the characteristic which governs that entire process of development of the biosphere as a whole. Because man uniquely can willfully direct his activity, can willfully, in effect, evolve towards higher states of energy flux density, evolve towards greater domains of reach and accessibility of resources through technological development, etc. And in that way, you see this, again, this very unique time relationship between how we act now, always as a function of where we necessarily must be in the future, but then as we do that, we actually change what the future is because the future itself is not also a fixed point. By acting on what at the moment we think is the future, we actually change what that actual future is. So it's always this push and pull dynamic relationship. The problem is to the extent that we don't do that, we necessarily will run into an extinction point because you always are dealing with a fixed amount of resources, so to speak in any mode of activity, right? You're always drawing down on, say, iron. The more we use up iron, the harder it is to access, the more expensive and energy intensive it is to, you, to get. So, if we wanna, so as we try to keep growing linearly without advancing towards higher energy flux densities, the cost of just maintaining the system as it is becomes more and more expensive physically, and you actually collapse, as all other species have collapsed. The only way to overcome that 
is by constantly willfully directing man towards creative breakthroughs, towards the introduction of new physical principles into his mode of activity, and thereby increasing the power of man and expanding the creative domain of man's reach into the universe. Well, one thing about the fact that resources aren't really fixed, but it's because of uh, the, w which is our problem today that we haven't been developing them. In other words, natural resources are man-made. Is this shows up in the agriculture area of what used to be called the Great American Desert, because you have to go dozens and dozens and, and hundreds of feet more into the ground to pump up water that only 20 years ago was much higher and easier. And at some stage, that just doesn't function anymore. And you're using less water on land, so all the salts are collecting because you aren't flushing it out. So that doesn't function anymore. So you are creating conditions because you never built nuclear power desalination on the Gulf or the Pacific. You didn't bring in the, the continental scale water conveyance like the North American Water and Power Alliance. Mm -hmm. But it's the end of the line. And you're seeing that in different places like the great, what could be very beautiful in the Sahel. Right now, millions of people are without food there because naturally it's prone to drought unless you do something about it. And that's been obstructed for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on Africa in particular, and then in, in context of, of what we just saw, I recently was able to go to a, an event in Washington, D.C. on Africa, specifically on the Sahel region, which is where you have Lake Chad, which, as people may know, has been drying up over the past 40 years, and this is the main source of irrigation for the region. So, you know, this event, which was hosted by the Woodrow Wilson Center, USAID, and other institutions, um, was ostensibly to address the crisis. What I had brought up was the Transaqua project, which really is something that's been there for, for decades at this point. It would completely resolve the, the problems with de desertification in the region and would really green the desert. And I also introduced the idea of planetary defense because really with the collapse of the transatlantic system, we can no longer think in terms of regions defending themselves. People can pretend to do that at this point, but the problem is the monetary system is gone. We have to think in terms of defending the planet. So introducing to this idea, you would think naturally people in the interest of Africa might want to accept that idea and, and fight for it. There's absolutely no interest for it. And what you get the sense of among a crowd like this is that there's almost an inherent belief that we should not allow the populations for these regions to grow, that they do not deserve the types of technologies that exist in the developed world, and it's better for them because we have fixed resources, so let's, let's keep it from them. And I know you've written about, in, specifically, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, for instance, who are the so-called uh, philanthropists of, you know, putting out solutions, so-called solutions for Africa but they really have a quite different agenda. Right, you said it. And a couple weeks ago, Bill Gates enunciated it again at Davos. Every year for the last four years, he's, his, uh, the Bill Gates Foundation puts out a letter, and he talks about agriculture around the world and Africa. And it's all from the point of view of being part of the kind of retinue, the courtiers of the British Empire types, literally uh, Prince Philip, the Queen, I mean, this London-centered world financial um, uh, web that is in, that itself controls um, major fertilizer, when it comes to food and agriculture, has monopolistic control over, as I say, fertilizers, chemicals, even the seeds, even the research to seeds. Beginning 40 years ago, they claimed patent right ownership. And Bill Gates speaks for these people. And he said, oh, well, the world has very fixed resources. We have to share them all. We can only have sustainability. If we find better ways to manage them, then he cloaks himself in the false cloak of science and says he's for science, better seeds and better methods. But for sure, we have to have the complete world market system. You have to, um, you can't allow 
and you can't change the control networks that I just described. And he said, moreover, primitive people should stick with primitive things. He doesn't quite put it that way. Africans like to eat root vegetables and cassava. We'll just work to make them a little less prone to blight and to insects and give a little bit here and there. He says the world is overpopulated and we should get rid of uh, the uh, pressure on the planet by getting rid of people. And he does it in the name of saying he's fighting disease and fighting to feed people. So it's a complete lie, and it's an infestation in Washington. Only in the last three or four years, especially, but before that, but in the Obama administration, you have part of this network. You have Dr. Beachy, the science advisor to the Agriculture Department. You have Rajiv Shah, who worked for Bill Gates for eight years, who is the head of USAID and not doing anything about Haiti. So we have an infestation to clean up here, and these are the obstruction. This is part of a dying system. They get all the publicity, but they're not only untruthful, they're, they're evil. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's who's saying we have to balance resources because we're at the end of the line and there's not enough room at Mother Nature's table and we have to kill people. It's called genocide. Yeah. And based on what we saw in this clip from the Weekly Report, what is your view of the idea of really pushing our boundaries? Because really what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to go to nuclear right away. But we're going to have to do that in the context of going towards fusion. In other words, we're going to have to really rev up all of the production centers all over all the industrialized nations. We're going to have to move this into the, into the, develop, the developing nations. But it has to be done on a very, basically, as as we went through in the weekly report, in a sense, we're kind of speeding up a crisis. We're going to be using a hell of a ton of resources in order to feed the world, in order to, you know, develop these nations. But we're going to do that because of the breakthrough that we're going to make towards a fusion-based economy. So what is your view of where we're going to be at? Well, let's do uh, immediate short term and then longer term, bearing on what you just said. Because one thing is we've been describing, there are millions right now in West Africa. We talked about Mexico, Haiti. We can go around the world. That needn't be. That's the good news, that we can do something about that, even the next planting seasons, the, the uh, animal husbandry, different, different livestock numbers and herds and practices. If we have an emergency orientation that we have to, uh, we can, we have to have the Obama administration at the top have him set aside so we can get on with the job, put in the kind of uh, financial tourniquet so you have the Restore the Glass-Steagall Act from 1933, because you had all the great developments in the 30s and during the Second World War, you doubled agriculture production. So do put in the Glass-Steagall Act so you have an actual basis for real credit and banking to then finance through uh, credit systems like the re Restored National Bank, the legacy of the United States, and then go for grants for uh, uh, domestic production here, rebuilding after all the disasters of 2011, and then uh, collaborate with other nations around the world in the same policy, have the maximum production this summer in the Northern Hemisphere, go for the maximum production uh, six to eight months from now in the Southern Hemisphere. Do that. We can take care of people. One thing is cancel this biofuels use of so much corn in the U.S. and mill it for human consumption as well as animals. You can do that. But keep uh, parity or floor pricing for all the farmers who invo are involved in supplying that corn to all of the ethanol plants because they're the, they're human, they're the capacity to get to the future. And then the future we're going towards, as Cody Jones was just describing in that, if we think about it, if, we, if you think of higher levels of deployment of higher types of, of uh, energy, of power in your system, then it's just, excuse the expression, the sky's the limit. But, I mean, you can, uh, you can go, there's a spectrum. You could go to almost completely controlled or protected agriculture, where you don't use soil at all, you use um, hydroponics or use soilless agriculture of different kinds, aeroponics they have, the way you would want to do in capsules and, and controlled conditions on the moon and in space. But in the meantime, there are, you would want to uh, 
intervene in the landscape with, of course, water and transportation, but bring to bear the kind of satellite systems of analyzing what is going on underground, how are your soils are doing, where are the pests, all the kinds of things you can do with um, uh, monitoring from space, and then including the famous precision agriculture. But go to the maximum deployment of that while you're building the on-the-ground system, such as the Transaqua system, to, to redirect some of the Congo River northward. Do, do the same thing at the same time. And then it's just limitless. And on that, just so people know exactly what, we're, what you're talking about, we prepared a clip on the idea of precision agriculture, which is something which we have today and we could actually utilize on a mass scale around the world which comes from the work, the breakthroughs that we've done in space. So we'll play that clip. As we turn our extended sensorium towards the Earth, we find ourselves with a new kind of sight. Happenings in and around the soil which once were invisible to us are now open to observation, study, and mastery. With a constellation of multispectral, hyperspectral, and other advanced instrumentation on land and in space acting in concert, we now have the capability to fine-tune how we work the land, writing and filling prescriptions to precisely fit the needs of a given crop and the needs of the land from which it grows. This is the art of precision agriculture, using every mode of instrumentation available to make the farm as efficiently productive as possible. Here, we will examine a particular element which comes under the scrutiny of our extended sensorium, crop stress, as an example of the types of case which can be identified with the current state of the art. We will also touch on how our capability in space allows us on the ground to work the land more effectively through the interface between the satellites in the sky and our modernized tractor capability. We associate the effects of stress in plants with leaves turning brown and leaves being shed, wilting stalks, and the like. In the open air, many factors can contribute to this, the most commonly recognized being drought, the brutal combination of prolonged intense heat and the correlative decline of available water. Along with damage to the chlorophyll centers, the organization of proteins within the cells falls into disarray, and the plant curtails its normal development, focusing attention on these problems instead. In our crops, this results in lower quality produce, as the organism's effort is spent in keeping itself alive, rather than on the reproductive organs which we harvest for food. In more extreme cases, the yield at harvest falls as the crop succumbs to the factors of stress and dies off. Some other factors of stress include salinity levels, disease, and pests. Using remote sensing instrumentation from above, we can identify stressed crops with an accuracy on the order of meters and on a time scale on the order of 24 to 48 hours. In other words, a farmer on the ground can get an accurate assessment of the state of all of the crops in production in a hurry. The importance of this becomes clear when you take into account that many farms are contiguous, with several smaller fields, sometimes in different counties, being managed by the same team which makes it more difficult and time-consuming to drive every hectare of land to get an on-the-ground assessment. A quick and accurate assessment is also key for those with large acreage operations and for cattle ranchers to determine the quality of their feeding ranges. One factor in being able to identify the characteristics of the vegetation under scrutiny, such as stress, lies in the manner in which the chlorophyll utilizes the sun's radiation, processing certain bandwidths for work, reflecting some bandwidths from the outside of the leaves, some from the inside of the leaves, and allowing some through altogether, where the radiation then reflects off the surface of the soil. In the healthy plant, the action of chlorophyll uses particular bandwidths of the light for its work in the blue and the red part of the spectrum. The bandwidth associated with green is rejected and reflected from the surface or the palisade of the leaves. This we recognize visually as the healthy, lush green. What we cannot see is what is happening in the infrared and near-infrared part of the spectrum. 
Under normal conditions, the spongy mesophyll cells inside the plant have a very high reflectivity to this portion of the spectrum, with the highest reflectivity in the near-infrared, with a couple of peaks in the shortwave spectrum. When this is mapped onto a graph, you see a characteristic waveform which, while presented here in a general form, can be normalized based on historical data and test plots to specific crops in particular areas, for comparison with actual measurements from the instruments above at different times in the growing season. As the plant begins to suffer under stress, the reflectivity in the near-infrared drops, while that of the rest of the spectrum rises. And as the stress becomes severe, we see a spike in reflectivity in the first peak of the infrared bandwidth. Seeing the unseen gives the farmer on the ground the intelligence they need to bring the crop back to a healthy state. Along with crop stress and vegetation vigor, we are able to monitor surface temperature, leaf chlorophyll content, leaf area index estimates, biomass and yield estimates, crop identification, crop density, soil moisture quality and quantity, soil moisture retention and drainage, vegetation indices, and this short list is sure to grow as we advance the art. With a reliable reading of these and other factors, as compiled with historical data and data from test farms, the modern farmer has the tools to craft a prescription for the tillage with a precision on the order of meters or tens of meters. Instead of treating a given field as a homogeneous unit and using a blanket approach to supplementing the fields with nutrients, the modern farmer can identify subregions within the tillage and tailor the plan of action to meet these needs. On board the tractor, the treatment which the farmer has prescribed is easily carried out. The prescription data set is uploaded to the onboard computer, which manages the application equipment and coordinates the travel of the tractor with GPS. With variable rate application, seeding, weeding, fertilizer, and other supplements can be applied in a more or less automated way, filling the prescription to the letter. The shaft motors, servo motors, and other parts related to the application equipment can all come under the control of the onboard computer. If a 20 meter section of a row needs fertilizer while the next 10 meters do not, then that's exactly what gets applied. Also, under GPS control, the tractor virtually drives itself, freeing the farmers to make on-the-ground assessments during daylight hours and allowing them to work the land day or night. Our extended sensorium gives us the ability to see the world as a whole with more depth than man has ever known before. While our focus here is on agriculture, the application of these new senses are only as limited as is our activity in managing and developing the biosphere. As we break the ground on the North American Water and Power Alliance and with other great projects across the globe, using these instruments in new ways will become invaluable. We will look back and wonder how we ever lived without them. Yes, I have to say, Lamori, a while back I called my brother in the Midwest and I said, what are you doing, bro? He said, well, I'm sitting here on the fence watching my tractor drive around the field. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. You don't even have to get in it anymore. Well, they, as the clip showed, yeah, they, they have uh, satellite guidance. <laughs> that's not for when you do the fertilizer and everything else, but it, everything, that's the reality that it's, th that's the future reality, which is now if we do our job. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I think we've covered a lot of ground, so we'll leave it there, unless you had any final remarks. No, I think we should just work for spring planting at the same time. <laughs> Let's get to work. <laughs> okay, so that's all for our first edition of Biospheric Engineering. We'll see you next time.